Order. Order. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's session of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Thank you, uh, Simon MacDonald, for coming at such short notice. We're extremely grateful. And thank you, Mr. Uh, Hobart and Mr. Williams, for joining him. So, Simon, would you give us a brief update on where we are and perhaps tell us a word or two about Sir Kim? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I spoke to Kim Derrick first thing this morning. Uh, he'd clearly had uh, a very difficult night considering his position, uh, but by the time we spoke, he had made up his mind that he uh, needed to uh, resign. I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, for two main reasons. Uh, one is uh, the pressure on his family, uh, that we, who have been living every minute with him, and he uh, did not want to put them through possibly months more. Uh, it was his judgment that for as long as he remained in Washington, uh, he would be a target and his family with him. Um, and second, uh, the impact on the rest of the embassy in Washington and their ability to work. As you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the ambassador is the, uh, the keystone of uh, any embassy, and if he does not have access to the people he needs to have, or she needs to have access, then the, the work of the whole mission suffers. Uh, so um, I, I don't think it was an easy decision, uh, but by the time we spoke, his mind was made up. Uh, I received his letter uh, and replied, uh, these uh, have now been uh, published uh, on the Foreign Office website, um, and uh, the resignation came in time for the Prime Minister to be able to pay tribute to his work during PMQs earlier today. Can you tell me, this is clearly an unusual uh, occurrence, do you know of any other occasion on which a, the head of state of a friendly government has refused to cooperate with any of Her Majesty's envoys? None. You've never heard of this happening before? I have been in the Foreign Office for nearly 37 years, and this is the first time in my service. Right. Well, that already is quite something. Chris, you wanted to ask? I mean, sometimes unfriendly states perhaps might have been more difficult. Perhaps the Chavez regime in Venezuela might have been difficult with the British ambassador into, over time. But, but has there been a... a yep. You are right, Mr. Bryant. This is not the first time a British ambassador has left post um, <laughs> but, um, or resigned because of uh, 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 actions taken by the host government, but uh, usually they are um, governments with whom we have problematic relations rather than friendly relations. And even then, have there been many occasions in your experience where, where, where there's been a refusal to work with the British, a complete refusal by a head of state to work with the British envoy? I know of none. Sorry, just to be clear, even with states which could be described as hostile or not friendly, you know of no occasion where the head of state has refused to work with the British envoy? Correct, but I distinguish between um, problems gaining agreement, so which is no, no, necessary for an ambassador to get there in the first place, and that that is the time when there are many just, difficulties. I mean, just explain agreement and that process. That will be worth us understanding. Um, when uh, the government posts an ambassador, uh, the appointment is made by the foreign secretary. All ambassadors and high commissioners serve. Uh, uh, at the pleasure of the Foreign Secretary. The appointment is approved by the Prime Minister and by Her Majesty the Queen, uh, but um, made by the Foreign Secretary. Uh, that process takes some time. Uh, once the Queen has given her approval, uh, the incumbent ambassador seeks the agreement of the host government to receiving her or his successor. Uh, it's one of the diplomatic rules that a receiving state has the right to refuse. Um, uh, the nominee of the sending state, and that has happened from time to time. Uh, and that is where the difficulty is generally revealed in... Uh, has it ever uh, happened with the United States? Um, uh, the last time I know that we had difficulty with the United States was 1856, um, <laughs> when um, the incumbent was accused of recruiting Americans to fight on the British side in the Crimean War. President Franklin Pierce was in the White House. 
Right. And Iran, I think, I'm right in saying, refused an agreement for our ambassador who was en route. We have had various run-ins with Iran. Correct, sir. Bob, you wanted to come in? Just, is it too early to, to think what the potential fallout from this is? Because clearly it's a very unique set of circumstances. Um, how do you think this is going to affect our relationship with the, the Trump administration or the US or the United States in the future? Uh, Mr. Celia, I think it's uh, too soon to have a, a, a complete or authoritative judgment. Um, uh, it's, nothing like this has ever happened before. No. There must be consequences. What they are in detail, I can't tell you this afternoon. In, in, in relation to that, yeah, just on, 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 I mean, we met Kim Derrick and we were all very impressed by him, and he's you know, clearly a, a highly capable individual. There's, there was an argument that he should ride this out and that the Foreign Secretary could have said to him, actually, on principle, you're staying, if only for two months, or until your post has come to an end, because on principle, whichever the state is and whichever the leader is, we are keeping our ambassadors in, play, in place. Now, clearly, if, if Kim Dark doesn't want to stay there, he doesn't want to stay, but there is an argument that actually we should say, no, you are staying. Which is why I had a conversation with Kim this morning about his resignation. Uh, the Foreign Secretary has been as clear as you have just been now, Mr. Seeley, uh, in private and in public, uh, that the question of who represents Her Majesty is for the British government, and that Sir, Sir Kim had the full support of Her Majesty's government and should stay in place until the end of his posting, which was already known to be the end of this year. Uh, so that point uh, was made by the Foreign Secretary, uh, but I repeat, Kim, knowing that, still decided that he should go because he did not think he would be able to do the work of a British ambassador. You had a conversation with the Foreign Secretary about this how many times in the past 24 hours? I know the Foreign Secretary has spoken to Sir Kim in the last six hours, but I wasn't privy to the detail of the conversation. Sorry, forgive me. We're very tight for time, and I appreciate Connor. They say how dignified I thought Sir Kim's resignation letter and your response was in contrast to the behaviour of those who forced him to resign and those who failed to defend him. You, have in your opening remarks, said he resigned because he thought he'd be a target because of pressure on his family, because of the impact on the embassy. I mean, that would be truly shocking at a diplomatic or in a diplomatic mission in a hostile country or a country with which we have complicated relations. How difficult a challenge will it be to manage this diplomatically with a country that is one of our longest standing allies with whom we've just exchanged state visits? How, how difficult a challenge is that? How unprecedented is it? How can the system respond to it if it is unprecedented? Uh, we will respond, Mr McGinn, because we have to. Um, the United States is our closest ally. Um, uh, across the board, in all spheres of life, we have the closest relationship with the United States. Uh, and I would add that we have a close relationship with the President of the United States, that the state visit last month, I think, was uh, a personal uh, success. Um, this is at variance uh, with um, uh, that success. Um, uh, this is as everybody is agreeing, unprecedented. But we will find a way through because we must. In terms of how this uh, unfortunate situation arose, can I ask you about confidence in two respects? Firstly, how confident are you uh, in terms of the FCO systems around the confidentiality of communications? And secondly, how confident can our diplomats be, particularly in more difficult postings, that they will continue to be able to give unfettered and unvarnished advice to our government without it being compromised? Uh, these are key questions for us, uh, Mr McGinn. Uh, we have good security systems and we are updating those security systems, but we will look in detail at how they are functioning in uh, the wake of what has happened this week. Um, but I would say and stress that uh, the systems are one thing, uh, but the people who operate them are the key thing. Uh, and that is uh, going also to be a focus of our work. 
because the human factor is the decisive one. We come back to that point, if you'll forgive me, Ian. Thank you, Chair. Can I just firstly echo Mr McGinn's points? I think the way that Sir Kim and yourself have responded to this shows the very best of the Foreign Office, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to others who should know better um, in terms of the way they've responded. Um, I just wanted, while we're on process, to ask you what the process will be for appointing a new ambassador from today and whether or not the Foreign Affairs Committee can, have a, can meet that particular person. Well, the, um, the process will be the same as for any ambassador, uh, which is that there will be an advert um, and uh, people will apply and be interviewed and a recommendation will be made by the Senior Appointments Board of the Foreign Office to the Foreign Secretary and then from the Foreign Secretary to the Prime Minister. That is the standard procedure. Uh, I think uh, it will not surprise you that the appointments to Washington don't always follow uh, standard procedure. Um, uh, so I can't tell you in detail how this particular appointment will be handled. I can tell you that history shows that there are often bespoke procedures for filling uh, the embassy in Washington, D.C. Mr. Murray asked, which is, can this committee meet the candidate? And I use the term candidate clearly. I at the will available juncture, at the appropriate juncture. As you know, um, uh, confirmation hearings are not a, a feature of uh, the British I system. Didn't ask but for I, I note the uh, committee's interest, indeed enthusiasm, and shall discuss this with the Foreign Secretary. Thank you. Mr. Gethins. Yeah, can I reflect the views of, of, of my colleagues and thank you for the handling of this? And how sorry I have to see the ambassador leave. I think it's particularly concerning that it would be good to get your remarks about the impartiality of the civil service, which is so important. And I was sorry to see, for example, the foreign, former foreign secretary not defend that a little bit more strongly yesterday. Can I ask how important is candour um, in the in the missives that you get back from your ambassadors anywhere in the world? It is vitally important, Mr. Gethins. It's the only way we can work. Um, the tradition in the British diplomatic service is openness within the diplomatic service. We have always believed in sharing the necessary information with all officials who needed to know. Uh, and over decades, that system has served us well. Uh, but clearly, right now, it is under unprecedented pressure to ambassadors elsewhere in the world who are reporting back from what, what I would have thought previously to be even more difficult circumstances than those in Washington, I would have thought up until the events of the past few days. What is your message to those ambassadors in terms of the protections that, that, that they should expect? Uh, I have already been in touch with all the ambassadors this week, uh, stressing that uh, unvarnished, honest analysis is what we need is what officials need in order to give the best possible advice to ministers so that their decisions can be as good and as evidence-based as possible. Uh, I think uh, I mean, we are, we're going to do a lot of uh, soul searching and this uh, uh, session I hope will feed into that. Um, one thing that uh, is under our control uh, is the distribution lists. Uh, that receive our most sensitive reporting. Uh, and so we uh, can, the, the person drafting has uh, control about how wide that readership should be. A diplomatic telegram, with which uh, Ms. Patel is very familiar, uh, goes to a, a wide readership. Uh, but um, emails and emailed letters uh, go to a much more targeted audience. What would your message be to the leaker about the damage that this has done in terms of the day-to-day -day work of the Foreign Office? That the leaker is guilty of the worst breach of trust in uh, our service in my career. Uh, the damage after three days is evident in the resignation of the most senior British diplomat. Can we just come very quickly onto the distribution of these particular and uh, messages. Uh, am I right in understanding they fall into different categories, right. as you have just described? So some of them are what you call diptels, and some of them are what you call email or letters. The letters in the particular case that we're discussing now, how many people did they go to? 
Um, this, Mr. Chairman, is already part of the investigation. Uh, you are right, there is a mix. Uh, and because the mix includes um, uh, emailed letters, that is uh, a line of active inquiry. Uh, but the, the team running it is using that information right now. I understand if you don't have an immediate yeah. answer to it, but yeah. you okay. And is there any way of knowing who has read or opened an email on the Firecrest system? I will turn to an expert. So um, on that, um, I, I think I have to be careful exactly what I say, but we do monitor traffic on the Firecrest network, yes. Pretty, you wanted to yes, thank you. Thanks very much. And I echo, obviously, the views of others about Sir Kim's resignation today. In light of the leak inquiry that has now taken place and the fact that there has been a leak and there's been sensitive communications put out in the public domain, have concerns over recent months and perhaps the last few years been raised at all about any potential leaks, any risks on any data or telegrams or diptels going out into the public domain? Um, and anything regarding cyber security and obviously distribution lists, which of course, as I mean, you've already said, are quite wide and vast, bear in mind the scale of the network too. Um, have any concerns been raised, either if not from ministers, but from diplomats themselves, um, in mission, in embassies, regarding security and some of the potential exposure of very confidential and sensitive information? Uh, these considerations, Ms. Patel, are always on our mind, and as you point out, uh, the, the, the challenge has changed in recent years, um, that uh, computer hacking is uh, a relatively uh, recent uh, phenomenon, um, uh, our need to be able to defend ourselves in cyberspace is a relatively new phenomenon, uh, and our experts are active to defend our systems. Um, and we have made progress, uh, but I repeat that no matter how good the systems, the people who operate them are the key, and generally when we have suffered a leak, it has been because a person has consciously done something wrong. Just on that basis, I mean, very specifically and directly, has Sir Kim ever raised any issues around sensitivity, secure, secure information, or any risk from the Washington end, um, from our mission there about any potential risks or threat on information being leaked? Bear in mind as well, obviously, the political climate in Washington, many of the other wider stories outside of HMG's footprint um, around cyber security, hacking, around the administration um, and around the US elections that took place a few years ago? To the best of my knowledge, Ms. Patel, no, that he has had confidence in the systems and in the people operating them. Uh, until four days ago, that was a confidence that had been rewarded, but no more. And just finally from me, I mean, obviously things will change off the back of what has happened. There's no doubt about that. You'll have the leak inquiry. But in terms of staff, I come back to civil servants and diplomats who do exceptional work. I've, I've had the privilege of working with many of our ambassadors around the world. What message are you sending to them right now? Because obviously they've seen one of the most exceptional diplomats resign from office over some very sensitive communications that have been leaked. In terms of rebuilding confidence and trust in the system with people who are thousands of miles away from London right now, feeling quite remote from HMG, what do you see your role in trying to instill confidence and give them reassurance actually about their own roles and the ability to be pretty candid in the information that they're sending back to London? Uh, this is an exceptional moment, uh, so I have already convened today an all-staff meeting at four o'clock, uh, so I will tell you now what I will tell my colleagues later. Um, uh, this is a personal tragedy for a friend and colleague. Um, this is uh, something which will make us look at our ways of working again, uh, but I will give them uh, one big assurance that uh, we will pursue the culprit with all means at our disposal uh, because it is very important uh, that the person is caught. Uh, and second, I will encourage them to continue uh, to work in the necessary traditional way. 
that we can't serve our Secretaries of State if we start um, concealing uh, key information. Uh, but I will encourage them uh, to think more carefully, even more carefully, about how they transmit uh, their most sensitive information. Can I jump in just for a moment? You, you say that Sir Kim has raised no concerns. To, to the best of my knowledge. To the best of your knowledge, absolutely. I have a Sunday Times article from the 13th of November 2016, which is the full publication of one of Sir Kim's diptels. Um, and it was written up by uh, Tim Shipman uh, on the day. Is there a pattern of leaking from the US Embassy? From the Embassy in Washington? Yeah. Um, uh, I, as I sit here, I don't think there is a pattern of leaking. I know there have been leaks uh, from uh, Washington uh, that afflicted previous ambassadors, uh, not just Sir Kim. Uh, but a diptel is the communication that goes to the widest yep. audience. And so even though the diptel you have is um, from Washington, just the fact that it is from Washington doesn't indicate that it was leaked in Washington. So can we go back to the numbers question? Of the more sensitive letters, are you assuming a readership in the five, ten sort of numbers, or are you assuming a readership of larger than that? Uh, the most sensitive do have distributions of 5 to 10 at the bottom end. Uh, but um, every communication these days is electronic, and every machine has a forward button. Every machine has a forward button? All computers have a forward button, Mr. Chairman. Some of the military systems don't. <laughs> so, please. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> so, may I add on that? The forward button may be within a controlled system. So, for example, our secret system, you can't forward outside <laughs> that secret domain. And as you would imagine, the auditing functions on that are stronger than they are on uh, official or official sens sensitive systems. Mr. Royston. Can I talk about sanctions for the culprit? Because the tragedy here is the ambassador who's done his job admirably and said exactly what he should have said in reporting to government. But the person that's leaked this is, is the one that you know, we would all like to see brought to um, justice, if that's the right word. Now, I don't know what the sanctions are. I suspect if you were leaking intelligence to a foreign body uh, while we were at the moment of national crisis, they'd be far worse than they would under these circumstances. But what are the sanctions for the culprit? And are they strong enough to deter anyone from doing it again in the future? Because this is becoming something now that we see, if it's not routinely, it's becoming that way, and it needs to be stopped. Uh, there are a range of sanctions, up to and including summary dismissal. Uh, if uh, a criminal case can be made, well then it will be turned over to uh, the Director for Public Prosecutions. Uh, the police are involved. Chris? Um, well, I think it's the Official Secrets Act, isn't it? Um, can I just check, first of all, there's no, there's no public interest defence, is there, in the Official Secrets Act? You can't say, oh, I'm a whistleblower. I am not a lawyer. I do not think there is a public interest defence in this case. I think it's only up to six months, isn't it, imprisonment is the maximum? Two years. Leave it's it's maximum. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I give penalty for breaching the trust of the British people? You've quite. You've said you, you've referred repeatedly to leaker. Um, I presume it's either a leak or a hack. Have you discounted hack now? Um, as the foreign secretary said on Monday, there's no evidence of a hack, but we have not excluded that. This is an open investigation. Is it at all possible that the United States might have intercepted the communication themselves? Uh, my personal view is no. We have a very uh, close relationship with the United States. Uh, we do not spy on each other. Has, do you, do you, what, what's morale like in the Foreign Office at the moment? Um, I think uh, people are shaken by what has happened. Um, there is a reason why I have asked to see all my colleagues at 4 o'clock this afternoon. 
um, uh, the basis on which we have worked all our careers suddenly feels as though it is challenged. Um, so uh, I think there is a need for reassurance and reflection, um, but the reflection needs to include uh, all the things the committee is talking about, uh, about how we handle uh, secure information and the systems on which they are transmitted. Doesn't the British political establishment have to stand absolutely shoulder to shoulder with the British ambassador in a moment like this? Every single element of it? I would say yes. And uh, my colleagues have noted what the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary have said with gratitude. And just one other question. It, it feels sometimes a bit as if the UK is being targeted by the American President. Um, I thought actually the most humiliating sentence of the week was the bit about the, pri the President told the Prime Minister how to do Brexit um, and, and then referred to her as foolish. Uh, and then there are attacks on the Mayor of... Stop you, Mr. Wright. We're not doing an investigation into the US Anglo US no, but relationship. No, the, question, the, the only question for me is whether this does need to, we need to recalibrate our relationship because of this process. Um, uh, the relationship with the United States is so deep and so wide uh, that it will withstand any individual squall. Can we move on from that because we want to focus very much on the, on the handling of information. There are a couple of quick questions then on that point, if I, if I could, Sir Simon. Can I just say, politicians don't sign the Official Secrets Act, do they? So if the Official Secrets Act was going to be used, it would be used against a soldier or a diplomat who had leaked these. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. Okay. Okay. Ministers have to sign the official secrets. Well, that's what I'm asking. Do, do, do the ministers sign? I have my director of security sitting next to me. Um, I'm not certain. I was subject to the ministerial code, but we can we can write back and confirm. Ministerial code isn't breaking the law; it's breaking no. the ministerial code. So you wouldn't be prose a po if a politician had leaked this, he wouldn't be prosecuted. He or she wouldn't be prosecuted because they've. You don't. Them. You don't have to agree to acts of parliament. Acts of parliament are binding on you, whether you agree to them or not. Signing the Official Secrets Act merely reminds you that you are bound by it. It doesn't change. Does it not the make it a, um, chair, Mr. Chairman, does it not make a, a criminal act? That's what I'm saying. Criminal act, whether you've signed the Official Secrets Act or not, in the same so way as murder is a criminal act, whether or not you've signed the Murder Act. Sorry. I believe the Chairman is, is correct, but I can write and confirm that. Um, there's a different process, but you notify somebody, um, which means that they are, it's easier to prove that they've broken that act because they've been notified of their responsibilities under it. But it doesn't necessarily, you know, the law doesn't only apply to those people. But we can, we can confirm that. The classifications used for the communications to and from diplomats overseas. Um, there are diptails which were on Firecrest. Were the emails sent under a Firecrest or a secure system as well? Sorry. So I think, so, we, yeah, I, I think we're not going to comment on the details of this particular investigation at the moment. We're we'll speaking answer generically the different systems which are used for communication. Do you, sorry, sorry. I was going to say, maybe say without commenting on the specifics of this case. Um, there are different levels of classification. They are official, secret, and top secret, and we have different IT systems for those different levels of classification. Is, that, moving on, that, is the FCO's policy on classification fit for purpose? I have never had the privilege of working for the FCO, but I did once upon a time have access to a Firecrest account, and I was told basically, don't put anything sensitive on it because the Russians read it. So if I'm told that Firecrest is, is hackable and easy to read, um, are you confident that Firecrest in this day and age has the level of security that you would wish to associate with it and to make sure that your communications are not hackable? It makes them less hackable. So, so we're, we're, there are different threats here. There are threats against espionage and hacking and there are threats against um, uh, uh, leaks and, and our stuff. So uh, Firecrest is a more vulnerable system. It's at the official level. It's, it's highly resilient in terms of attacks against it. Um, but you wouldn't, but there are certain communications you then want to record it secret. But we have that system. In fact, we have a new government-wide system which we've been rolling out over the last year with a, probably the biggest uptake of that um, uh, uh, secret level system, which also, because it's Whitehall-wide, um, enables us to share information very confidently across the whole of government. Do you see any reason to revise this and what you're doing in the systems that you're using in light of what's happened? 
So the other thing we, we constantly look at our um, systems. As I say, I don't want to say too much about that, but we do monitor uh, the system. We use the three-tier uh, system to protect very sensitive information according to the government security classification, uh, the official secret, top secret, the definitions of which are on the, on the uh, internet. Um, but I would say also, as um, Sir Simon has said earlier, that this uh, comes down to individual use of that. And um, uh, ultimately, no system could be 100% secure if people use it. Does the system allow the sender to disable the forward function? So, as um, Mr. Hobart said, um, that there are um, different ways that we do that on different systems. Um, so, uh, uh, we, uh, it's about keeping information within the environment of the people who have access to that system at the appropriate classification levels. So long as you are at the appropriate classification level, you can forward anything to anyone? So, you can forward information to people within uh, within systems who need to see it. Then uh, various procedures come into play. So when anybody signs up to, the, uh, to use the FiveCare system, for example, they have to sign security operating procedures and they contain information about how to use things within that system, such as only forwarding things to people if they have a real business need to know. Is that a bit like the terms and conditions that you tick the box and click accept? Or is it... Well, it's, it does involve training, both, both, both at, to use a standard system, the official system, or to use the secret system or the top secret system. All of those involve different training levels. And they have more constraints over what you can and can't send and who you can send it to. What about just taking a picture of the screen? So uh, where, where our secret and top secret systems are, you generally are not allowed to have um, uh, any mobile or photographic devices in those areas. And printing? Um, I don't want to go too much into the details of the security of our systems, but there's, as the systems become more secure, the capability to protect them and the constraints on the user are greater. So generally you're not allowed to take your telephone in, but you could? Uh, well, you'd be explicitly breaking rules, regulations, things which are monitored, and, and it's monitored. Because obviously anyone that's leaking are breaking all the rules, so we've established that, but it's monitored so that you can't take your telephone in. So there, are different, there are different ways that we monitor that in different places, depending on the risk. Pretty, you wanted to come in? No? Ian? Can I just ask, I mean, we don't want to go into the, the leak itself, because obviously you've just, you've just uh, um, launched the inquiry, but what classification did this message have? Well, that's part of the inquiry, Mr. Murray. So, uh, I, I mean, all of this will be part of the report, but th this will come out later. A more general question, um, a hypothetical question, of course, but wh what damage would it do to, the, to every foreign mission across the world if the leak inquiry was to conclude that it was politically motivated? Uh, well, I assume in those circumstances, Mr. Murray, that we would have a complete story and that the complete story would give us, uh, you know, indicate what we needed to do next in order to prevent a repetition. And, ju and just following that up, and uh, a short follow-up from my previous question, what systems and checks and balances are in place at the Foreign Office with an ambassadorial appointment of such importance? Um, if that next ambassadorial appointment was a political appointee? Um, that, uh, as uh, the committee knows, we have one political appointee in the network, who is Lord Llewellyn, uh, the ambassador at Paris. Um, as a British ambassador, he is treated as part of the FCO organization. Uh, he is treated in uh, no different way. Which I might add includes going through vetting procedures um, in order to see classified information and work in classified areas. So the, the, a political appointee would still have to go the, through the same rigorous checks and balances as, as someone who would go through that advertising and application process? To get access to classified information, yes. Not to be appointed. But not to be appointed. Or they would. Yeah. Mr. Murray's asking whether or not any political appointee would have to go through similar. Uh, 
I mean, uh, the, uh, a political appointee, by definition, is made by uh, the Prime Minister, um, and she or he will name the person. But then to do the job, uh, to have access to the information to do the job, that person is subject to security procedures. But that happens after as I, the nomination. If a nomination was made and an individual didn't pass those security procedures, do they stay in post, or are they therefore barred from being in that position? To my knowledge, that has not happened. If it were to happen, Mr Murray, I foresee a difficult conversation for myself with the <laughs> Foreign Secretary. Mr Brandt. Um, some newspapers have suggested that, that there is more to come. Now, I don't know whether they mean more to come in relation to the United States of America or, or other places, because obviously other um, information has been leaked in, in other places in recent years, or hacked, I think. Um, I just wonder um, whether you expect that um, and whether, what you're doing to make sure that we are protected against that. Uh, I've seen the same press reports. Uh, so it's, 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 as, as you acknowledge, it's entirely entirely speculative as to what it means. Um, I'm just bracing myself. So you fear that there may be more? I fear there may be more. In relation to the United States of America or elsewhere, you don't know? I do not know. It's just what the press have read. Just one other thing. Um, about political appointees, um, we, 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 this committee has been to see Lord Llewellyn, and, and I think we were very impressed by the way he was performing his, um, his duties. They obviously have a place, but they're relatively rare in the British system, but they're entirely common in the American system. Is there a clash here? Um, different countries do this in different ways. I was ambassador to Israel, and their law allows up to 11 uh, political appointees at any one time. As you know, the United States is it's between one-third and one-half uh, at any one time. In the United Kingdom, it has generally been zero, one, or two. Uh, right now it is just one person. It's but, but it's something that is familiar for many decades. Um, uh, but it's tended to be high commissioners, hasn't it? Um, latterly, uh, the high commissioner to Australia has been uh, a politician on, I think, two occasions, uh, three occasions in the last um, 20 years. South Africa. Uh, South Africa as well, but also to the United Nations in New York. Uh, yeah. Lord Richard was a political appointee. On, forgive me, and again, conscious of time. Um, can I just ask some quite specific questions? Do you believe that your diplomatic staff are now confident that their communications are secure? So I think that they understand that there's a, there's a human risk, as Sir Simon has pointed out, um, and therefore the importance of, uh, of controlling distribution lists. And that was a message which Sir Simon reinforced again on Monday. Um, that, and, 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 and also, uh, not pressing the forward button, um, uh, one of our um, uh, rules is if you want to press the forward button because you think somebody else needs to know it, you check with the person that sent it as well, because maybe they do and maybe that's fine. Um, I don't think, I think people understand the systems reasonably well and they know what risks there are. This has been an exceptional week. And I hear what you're saying about informing staff and getting teams together. But what uh, immediate actions are you planning to take to ensure uh, the confidence of staff overseas? Because this isn't just about uh, the way that they handle information, it's also about the way that they're supported should that information come out. Um, well, the investigation is a very important part of reassurance, and that is going, you know, it's being taken as seriously as it can be taken. Um, uh, but I, another part is the, the new system, which... Um, the Foxhound has, system. The, the, yes, now called ROSA. Um, and um, that has already been rolled out. It's critically important to uh, what happens next. Uh, just very quickly on this, I mean, looking at the leaks themselves, I don't know if you're in a position to comment, it doesn't strike me as being a sort of Chelsea Manning-style massive data breach because they're quite, they're, they are a, a, a mixture of things and it looks more likely that somebody has got hold of some emails and some dip tells rather than a larger dump of information. I note your view, but uh, uh, forgive me for not commenting on it. Can I just, before, 
just one second, sorry. Have you had any communications with the US Embassy here about recent days? Um, I have had a meeting with the US um, charge, yes. Interview no coffee or? <laughs> <laughs> it was a diplomatic encounter. Was it a free and fair exchange of views? Free and frank exchange of views, sorry. Uh, I would not dispute the characterisation. <laughs> that, that is a question of Mandarin. <laughs> Mandarin, but yes. Uh, Chair, thank you. Thanks. So, Simon, I'd like to come on to the inquiry itself. Obviously, there's a structure around this inquiry. Um, I'd like to ask some very basic factual questions, if I may, around who will be conducting the inquiry. Um, what are the terms of reference for the inquiry as well? And in particular, who will they be reporting to? Bear in mind, obviously, you are the head of the Foreign Office, um, but also there's going to be a bit of transition over the next few weeks as well with a changing Prime Minister. And are you anticipating the formal end result, a report of some sort, to be published fully? or are you going to wait and see what the actual inquiry just surfaces before you think about what will be published, what will be redacted, and what information could go in the public domain? Um, these are all good and essential questions, Ms. Patel, but I'm going to look to Mr. Hobart to give what we can say at this point. So the Cabinet Office leading the inquiry, working obviously with my team and others, um, ultimately the inquiry report to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I can't really comment on the terms of reference, and in terms of a report, I think it will depend where the inquiry goes. Um, I think did that may, may not have answered your questions. <laughs> but was I anything very the obvious? I didn't. In terms of what you can answer right now, are you able to even allude to or indicate in terms of people that will be involved in the inquiry itself? So, for example, um, so Simon, you've already mentioned the police being notified. Are you likely to include serving and foreign ministers, for example, in this inquiry? There's been some changes over the years and, in fact, weeks and months in terms of ministers too. Um, and are you effectively going to be, I know you can't talk about terms of reference, but is that something that's under active consideration? And are you able to say anything around if they refuse to participate, what kind of actions will be taken? I note, Ms Patel, that you're the um, uh, question is really in the form of a suggestion, uh, so we will we note what you said and we'll share this with the inquiry. Committee meet whoever is leading the inquiry. We will discuss that. I will discuss that with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. It would be very grateful. Mr Seeley. Do you have, just finally, do you have any sort of time lengths in mind? Are you looking to get an interim report in the month? Are you going to be coming back in six months' time saying we're, we're still looking at things? So it's, it's only three days in. So we're really don't have that scoped out yet. It depends, it depends where the initial leads take us. I think that's an important... Well, there is a sense of urgency, be but assured. If you don't find out something in the next two to three weeks, you're going to come back and say, we're still looking, here's interim findings, or, or are we, is there going to be radio silence until, until you come out with a final conclusion? I, I really think it's too early to say. Um, I know that Simon has made another taking to come back later on, <laughs> but it's on future date. You know you'll be back. <laughs> I know I will. Be Not just on this subject. Exactly. Um, so, Simon, the, the 2016 article that I highlighted earlier was clearly a leak. What was the inquiry that followed up from that? Uh, I do not have that specific um, article or cable in front of me, but I will uh, write to you and let you know. Thank you. I'd be very grateful because it, it would be a it would be more than a shame for this culture to endure. Mr. Murray. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just one last question. I want to try and pursue a little bit about these political appointments, if I may. Um, can you just give us maybe a flavour of the top four or five specifications that you would have in an advert for the UK's top political ambassadorial job in America? Well, there is a distinction, Mr. Murray, between political appointees and uh, ambassadors for which we advertise externally. Uh, a political appointee is made uh, on the decision of the Prime Minister. This is allowed by the CRAG of 2010. Um, and as you, right now we have just one, as I've mentioned, Lord Llewellyn. Um, we also have the option of advertising externally, uh, which we do from time to time, most recently last month, where we put an advert in The Economist and The Financial Times uh, for um, uh, three 
senior ambassadorships and one governorship. Uh, so right now there are live competitions for the ambassadors at Luxembourg, Kuwait and Seoul and for the governorship of Gibraltar. Uh, those uh, initial competitions close later this month and then there will be a process in which internal candidates will be considered alongside external and a recommendation will be made to the Foreign Secretary. So it looks like there will be a specification in the job that says that the... External ones, yes, there is a job description, so uh, possible candidates can see um, the skills, competencies we're looking for as they weigh whether or not to apply. So that is a part of the process, but a political, a purely political process does not include that. So, so the specification to put in a non-remainer who wants a trade deal with America, which has just been tweeted by someone who has already tipped themselves for the post, would not be part of those specifications for the job? Uh, that would not be part of the FCO specifications. Thank you. That's all I need to do. Can I talk about the nature of dip tells? Do you write them for FCO staff? Um, do you write them for ministers? Do you write them for both? Or do you write them so that diplomats here can shape opinions and give ministers options? So who's that ultimate audience? I've been an ambassador twice, Mr. Seely, and dip tells were a, a key um, part of communication. Uh, when you wanted to get uh, information widely through the system. Um, so DibTels are uh, uh, a form of communication that's shared around Whitehall. Um, so it's, it's generally um, information that is not particularly sensitive, but which is not being picked up in the main media uh, and which British officials will benefit from knowing. Is there a period in our history where you feel that diplomats have been, had to be more politically astute. I'm thinking maybe the ambassadors in Berlin and Moscow in America in the 1930s and 40s, where you were writing whether you know, tumultuous changes taking place in those countries, but also back in the UK when you're writing um, for a political culture which might have been out of step with what the Foreign Office thought was happening or thought would happen. I think our duty as public servants is clear no matter the government of the day. The definition of a public servant is someone who can work for whatever government the people elect. That, that culture has always been consistent through periods of our history where there have been significant political changes either here or abroad in those countries. My reading of our history is yes, we have consistently sought to give an objective, impartial and honest stream of advice. And well, maybe Sir Neville Henderson in Berlin in the late 1930s was seeking to please Sir Neville Chamberlain and Adolf Hitler at the same time rather too much to be able to give candid and proper advice. But anyway, I just wanted to ask about the political appointments because I didn't quite understand what you said earlier. Is, when it's in a political appointment, is it just that the, it, it's an idea that springs up in the Prime Minister's mind, I'm going to appoint X, or is there a formal process, A, where one decides this is going to be a political appointment, not a traditional one, not a, 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 a diplomatic service one. Um, and then there's a second process whereby there's an advert and they decide on who that political appointee is going to be. Or is it just a decision in the head of them? Uh, the, um, the, the, my experience of political appointees is that the uh, Prime Minister decided um, he, um, uh, Mrs May has not done this, uh, wanted to make a yep. political appointment with a person in mind. Right. And so there is no advert, there's no job spec. Um, uh, it, is, it goes through the system in a different and uh, quicker way. Um, the, uh, the advert I talked about is, is not a political appointment. Right. It's, it's just right. a, it's an appointment on merit, but seeking a wider selection of candidates. Wait, under the CRAG Act. Under, well, because it applies to all civil servants, yeah. appointments yeah. of civil yeah. servants from outside the civil service. Yeah. Can yeah. I, and just, uh, uh, and, and, just then, at the, in this moment now, you are intending to start the process for uh, the Washington Post in the normal conventional diplomatic service way. Um, so Kim resigned less than three hours ago, yeah. um, uh, and he is available to serve. You know, he's not disappearing from Washington immediately. Uh, I will discuss that process with uh, the Foreign Secretary as soon as I see him. Right. Sure. In just over three months, we're making a fundamental change to our foreign policy.
policy laid down. Are you confident that the Foreign Office is correctly structured and has the appropriate systems to manage an international network at a time that has never been more important to the United Kingdom? Uh, we are working on it, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the last two years, yes. we have expanded that network. Uh, so we have returned particularly to some Commonwealth countries from which we had withdrawn in the first decade of this century. So when this expansion is complete, which will be by the end of next year, we will have uh, missions in 161 countries. So we will have the biggest network of any European country. I appreciate what you're saying, but that's, that's a numerical answer yeah. to a qualitative question. Whether or not the Foreign Office is ready is as much a question about morale in the mission in Washington and Paris as it is about the number of missions we may have in sub-Saharan Africa. Are you confident that those we send abroad and ask to undertake some of the most important jobs on behalf of the British people are appropriately supported, resourced and encouraged to take on those roles and to deliver the best that they can for Britain? Yes, but we have more work to do. Um, we had our leadership conference in London last month when all heads of mission uh, returned to London. And my reading uh, of the mood was that morale was quite high. Uh, people like a serious job of work to do, and we surely have a serious job of work to do. You do. Can I uh, close this session by, first of all, thanking you for coming at incredibly short notice and for giving us an hour of your time. I'm extremely grateful. And I secondly ask, on behalf of the committee, for you to pass on our very deep gratitude to Sir Kim, not just for his four years in Washington, but his 30 or more years in the service. 42. Of 42 years. There you go. I was three when he came to the Foreign <laughs> Office. Uh, for his 42 years uh, serving our country in any number of different posts uh, with enormous distinction, great personal courage and great distinction. Could you also please pass on to your entire staff uh, our very deep gratitude for the work that they do and our respect for their uh, endeavours. Uh, um, I know this is a hard time for them and we are grateful. I shall do the first when I speak to Sir Kim later and the second when I see my colleagues at four o'clock. Thank you very much. Order, order. Committee Room 16, Sound. Committee Room 16.
Sound check, sound check. Can you hear me back there? Is that coming clear? Great, wonderful. Good afternoon. Let me start by reiterating that I'm pleased that the New York prosecution is going forward. They brought these charges based on new evidence against Jeffrey Epstein, who is now a registered sex offender, and this is a very, very good thing. His acts are despicable, and the New York prosecution offers an important opportunity to more fully bring Epstein to justice. In 2008, a major newspaper described the Epstein prosecution like this. A Florida grand jury, that is a grand jury convened by the district attorney of Palm Beach County, had charged Epstein with a lesser offense. At that time, the Epstein legal team was elated he would have avoided prison altogether. But then the United States Attorney's Office in Miami became involved. Epstein got an ultimatum, plead guilty to a charge that would require jail time and registration or face federal charges. And that was the week more than 10 years ago that Epstein went to jail. Times have changed and coverage of this case has certainly changed since that article. Facts are important and facts are being overlooked. This matter started as a state matter. It was prosecuted initially by the state of Florida and not by the U.S. Attorney's Office. In 2006, a grand jury convened by the state attorney, the district attorney of Palm Beach County, reviewed the evidence and recommended a single charge. And that charge would have resulted in no jail time at all, no registration as a sexual offender, and no restitution to the victim. Further, the state attorney's office allowed Epstein to self-surrender and arraigned him the following morning. Simply put, the Palm Beach State Attorney's Office was ready to let Epstein walk free, no jail time, nothing. Prosecutors in my former office found this to be completely unacceptable, and they became involved. Our office became involved. Our prosecutors 
as this 2008 article recounts, presented the ultimatum, plead guilty to more serious charges, charges that require jail time, registration, and restitution, or we'd roll the dice and bring a federal indictment. Without the work of our prosecutors, Epstein would have gotten away with just that state charge. Now, many today question the terms of that ultimatum, what's called the non-prosecution agreement. A good prosecutor will tell you that these cases are complex, especially when they involve children, and even more so in 2006. I've shared with those in this room today and will make available publicly an affidavit filed by the career prosecutor in a civil matter related to the Epstein case. She talks about the challenges faced. She talks about the victims being scared and traumatized, refusing to testify, and how some victims actually exonerated Epstein. Most had significant concerns about their identities being revealed. The acts that they had faced were horrible, and they didn't want people to know about them. And she goes on to write that, quote, after the fact, people alleged that Epstein would have been easily convicted. As the prosecutor who handled the investigation, she says in this affidavit, these contentions overlooked the facts that existed at the time. Her description of these facts are corroborated by the FBI case agent whose affidavit I've also shared today. Thousands of prosecutors around the nation this week are weighing guilty pleas versus trials. These cases, as I said, are hard. They require a prosecutor to ask whether a plea that guarantees jail time and guarantees registration, to ask whether that plea versus going to trial, how do you weigh those two? if going to trial is viewed as the roll of a dice. The goal here was straightforward. Put Epstein behind bars, ensured he registered as a sexual offender, provide victims with the means to seek restitution, and protect the public by putting them on notice that a sexual predator was in their midst. This case, people have said, was unusual. And it was. It was complicated by the fact that this matter started as a state investigation. A state grand jury brought that single, completely unacceptable charge. A state official allowed Epstein to self-surrender. And so it is unusual because it's unusual for a federal prosecutor to intervene in a state matter such as this. We've seen cases recently, different set of facts, different. I don't want anyone to say I'm comparing these cases, but we've seen other cases where state prosecutors let folks go with no sentence and people shake their heads. In this case, the federal office intervened before the plea was taken and said, stop, because if that plea is taken at the state level, you're going to face serious federal issues. Today, we know a lot more about how victims' trauma impacts their testimony. And this, too, is important. Our juries are more accepting of contradictory statements, understanding that trauma-impacted memories work differently. And today, our judges do not allow victim shaming by defense attorneys. I have viewed the victim interviews. They're hard to watch because I know that my former colleagues, the men and women of my office, wanted to help them. I wanted to help them. That is why we intervened. And that's what the prosecutors of my office did. They insisted that he go to jail and put the world on notice that he was and is a sexual predator. Epstein's actions absolutely deserve a stiffer sentence. 
for years, there have been rumors of investigations in other jurisdictions. And he should be prosecuted in any state in which he committed a crime. If there are other states in which he committed crimes, if there are other states that can bring state charges, they should consider those as well. And so I absolutely welcome this New York prosecution. It is the absolutely right thing to do, and I'm happy to take questions. Eric. Eric Moran. How would you describe uh, your relationship with the president? And do you feel that the news of the cycle here with Epstein is changing that? Um, my relationship with the president is outstanding. Uh, he has, I think, very publicly um, made clear that, that I've got his support. He spoke yesterday in the Oval Office. He and I have spoken. Um, let me add, I, uh, I keep reading about articles uh, about my relationship with me and Mr. Mulvaney. And uh, he called me this morning to say, if, if asked, that our relationship is excellent too and that any articles to the contrary are, in his words, BS. Um, and, uh, and so it's, I'm here, I'm defending this case, that's my job. Tom. Tom. Tom Yamas, ABC again. News. Secretary, a lot of people are watching this news conference, including several young women who say they were teenagers when Jeffrey Epstein sexually assaulted them. They say they went to you looking for help, and they didn't hear back from you until it was too late. Do you owe them an apology? So you're raising the issue of victim notification. And um, in the documents that I've circulated, I've addressed the issue of victim notification as well. The career prosecutor in this case had a difficult decision to make, and she didn't make it alone. She made it in consultation with the FBI, and she made it in consultation with the office. The agreement that had been negotiated had an unusual provision. Even though this was a state case, the victims would have the opportunity to receive restitution. Epstein would be required to pay for them to hire a lawyer to bring a case against him, a case in which he would have to plead no contest and provide them with restitution. And the concern, and th these are the words of the career prosecutor, that, quote, she did not want to share with the victims that the office was attempting to secure for them the ability to obtain monetary compensation because she is aware that if she disclosed that and the negotiations fell through, Epstein's counsel would use this to question the victim's credibility. And her concerns were not hypothetical. One of Epstein's attorneys had already asked one of the victims, quote, now tell me about when the federal prosecutors told you about getting money. And so when the agreement was signed, shortly after the agreement was signed, Epstein's counsels indicated that Epstein may not comply with the agreement, and the agreement was appealed at various levels within the Justice Department. And she details in this affidavit, an affidavit that's also corroborated by the FBI case agent, how she and he and the office was concerned that Epstein might not comply, and we would have to go to trial. And we had to weigh the issue of how much to disclose against the issue of if we have to go to trial, we want to win. We want to put Epstein away. And talking about this would allow him to make the argument at trial that their testimony was compromised. And so when she was finally, when it was finally clear that Epstein would comply with the agreement, she talks about how she made efforts to notify the victims, how that was a Friday afternoon at 4.15, and that she learned that the state had scheduled the plea for 8.30 the following Monday. And she talks about how over the weekend she made every effort to notify the victims at that time. But then why did the judge move to violate his rights? The judge moved to violate his rights. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, earlier you described as 
address. And I wanted to uh, draw your attention to uh, APA standards for prosecutors, uh, standard 3-4.3, which says a prosecutor should seek or file criminal charges only if the prosecutor reasonably believes the charges are supported by probable cause, that the admissible evidence will be sufficient to support conviction beyond a reasonable doubt, and that the decision to charge is in the interest of justice. Did you believe, sir, that the evidence against Epstein would have been sufficient to secure conviction beyond a reasonable doubt for the federal offenses listed in the non-prosecution agreement? And if so, why was it not in the interest of justice to charge him with these crimes? So again, I would refer you to the documents I've provided. There is a big gulf between sufficient evidence to go to trial and sufficient evidence to be confident in the outcome of that trial. And so, so if, if I could, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a follow-up in a minute, but if I could. And so when this case, and, and I provided a letter that outlined some of the timeline of this. In July of 2007, the career staff from my office met and they said, these are the four points that you will have to do in state court. And if not, we will proceed federally. They were very serious that they would proceed federally. That does not mean that they were confident in the final outcome. And one of the tough questions in these cases, what is the value of a secured guilty plea with registration versus rolling the dice? And I know that in 2019, looking back on 2008, things may look different. But this was the judgment of prosecutors with dozens of years of experience. If you look through that letter, you'll see this was not a single person making those decisions. We wanted to follow up. So, respectfully, sir, uh, you described uh, what would happen if uh, the objectives deal is uh, you would roll the dice uh, with charges. And, and I understand that you're uh, saying now that uh, it's, it's never, it's never a, a slam dunk, but it, it, it seems that it seems like you're you're making this out to be a case in which you held the possibility of a federal indictment over the head of Mr. Epstein to get him to plead to a lesser crime, and that in and of itself uh, is is against the uh, ABA. Uh, I, I I do not think that the office violated the ABA standards by negotiating strongly and forcefully. Sir. So standing here today, are you basically Mike? saying that you feel that you did everything you could, you got the best deal you could get, and you have no regrets? We believe that we proceeded appropriately, that based on the evidence, and not just my opinion, but I've shared the affidavit, based on the evidence, there was value to getting a guilty plea and having him register. Look, no regrets is a very hard question. At my confirmation hearing, I was asked a similar question. And one of the, one of the issues that I raised is we expect a lot more transparency today. As you watch these victim interviews, it's very obvious that the victims feel that this was not a sufficient outcome. These victims were traumatized. We can't begin to understand what they went through. And they look at this and they say, but why? And so you always look back and you say, what if? What I can say is, at the time, and I've provided a timeline, I've provided information about the individuals involved, this was the view of the office. There is a value to a sure guilty plea because letting him walk, letting what the state attorney was ready to do go forward would have been absolutely awful. Ben. ben. Yes, Ben Penn from Bloomberg Law. Um, you know, in light of the uh, attention this week on, on uh, your handling of, uh, back in 2008, 
victims of uh, sex trafficking. I wanted to ask about your role today as a lab Secretary of Labor. You have oversight through the Wage and Hour Division of uh, certifying visas for victims of uh, human trafficking, including sex trafficking. And uh, just last week, your uh, Wage and Hour Division issued a new policy that would uh, essentially allow the agency, uh, it's being criticized by a lot of people I talked to, for allowing the agency to completely remove itself or to virtually remove itself from um, continuing to certify these visas by referring them to other agencies. How can you uh, so, defend, what was the purpose of that? So, so that, that is, if, if you read the policy, that is not what it does. Our wage and hour administrator, after she was confirmed, came in and she reviewed the policies. And she put in place a requirement that a criminal prosecutor be consulted any time one of these issues is brought to the division's attention. And that seems very reasonable. Don't we want criminal prosecutors to be consulted whenever someone says that they are a victim of trafficking? And that prosecutor will be consulted. And even if that prosecutor says this is not a case that we are going forward with, the division will still consider whether to issue that visa on the facts. So that is a mischaracterization of her decision and her policy. Yes. Could you go into a bit more detail about where and how uh, you exactly negotiated this deal? Did you meet with Epstein's attorney alone at a Marriott hotel? So, you know, I've read this, and one of the things I find interesting is how, um, how facts become facts because they're in a newspaper as opposed to the record. Um, I pulled up, I, I found out the details of that meeting because I scratched my own head about it, and I have provided you a timeline in a letter of the negotiations that make it very clear that this was negotiated by career prosecutors. The, I'm, I'm going to answer your question. The meeting that was alleged was a breakfast meeting that took place after the agreement was negotiated, not before. The agreement was signed in September. After the agreement was negotiated, one of Epstein's attorneys asked for a meeting, asked for a hearing. I was giving a speech. I was staying at a hotel. I agreed to have a brief meeting, I believe at 7 a.m. Rather than open the office, I spoke with that attorney. And then I referred that attorney to the career prosecutors. Nothing changed in that agreement. They continued to litigate the matter. They continued to appeal the matter to Washington. And nothing changed with one, one exception. There was an addendum that made clear that Epstein had to pay for any attorney that a victim, that represented a victim in the cases against Epstein. And so Yes, I met with opposing counsel. It was a breakfast meeting because I was staying at the hotel. It was after, after, not before, and not part of the negotiations, but it was after the agreement had been negotiated. And that could be confirmed simply by looking at the date on the agreement and the date on the meeting. So, number one, the agreement had already been locked in place, so the agreement wasn't going to change. Before that agreement, you know, I was very careful to not negotiate this. Our career attorneys negotiated the agreement. Secondly, I'd point out, we live in a city where people have breakfast meetings all the time. You don't open an office at 7 o'clock in the morning just to have a meeting. You have it over breakfast. Secretary Ian. Secretary Costa, it's not standard for a non-prosecution agreement to include a let me, let, let me Let me do this. I, 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 had, I had called Ian. I'll come back to you. Girls, I'll come back to you. Don't the young girls. I, I, I wanted to give Ian an opportunity. I'll come back to you in a minute. Thank you, sir. Um, You've mentioned several times that you and the prosecutors in, in your office weren't sure that you could secure a win in this case. But the very purpose of the, of the CVRA is to give the victims an opportunity to weigh in. And a federal judge ruled that you broke federal law by not doing so. Do you think that your thinking would have been different had you followed the law and consulted the victims? So um, first, let me, let me point out, we followed department policy. Department policy at the time made very clear, and this is in a written statement that was subsequently issued by what is called the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the chief policy making, the chief legal arm of the Department of Justice, that these situations with non-prosecution agreements 
are not covered by the CVRA at the time because the CVRA, according to department policy, does not attach until a case is actually brought. Now, I understand that the judge had a different view, and I understand that the judge's view was that department policy did not comply with the law. And that's the way our system works. Our system works in that a judge can say what the department policy is is not consistent with the law. Now, let me also point out, since then, a few years ago, Congress amended the CVRA, and Congress amended it explicitly to say that non-prosecution agreements would be, in fact, covered. And that is a good thing. I, as I said at my confirmation hearing, you know, we expect a lot more transparency. If we had had more transparency, perhaps this case would have gone differently. I've laid out the reasons why there were concerns about providing all the details to the victims before Epstein pled. Um, but the Department of Justice has been very clear throughout multiple presidential administrations, throughout multiple attorneys general, that the department's position is that there was no violation of the law. One yes, I, Would you make I'm, I'm the sorry, same? I'm sorry, your name and, and who you're with? I'm Caitlin Collins for CNN. Yeah. Would you make this same agreement today? So these questions are always very difficult because we now have 12 years of knowledge and hindsight, and we live in a very different world. Today's world treats victims very, very differently. Today's world does not allow some of the victim shaming that could have taken place at trial 12 years ago. Today's world understands that when interviewing victims, when eliciting testimony, that testimony can be sometimes contradictory, that memories are difficult. And so I don't think we can say, you know, take a case that is this old and fully know how it would play out today. But these victims say you failed them. I, I understand what the victims say, and I'm not here to try to say that I can stand in their shoes or that I can address their concerns. I'm here to say we did what we did because we wanted to see Epstein go to jail. He needed to go to jail. But he was out of jail before he needed, the victim he needed, found out about this agreement. He needed to go to jail. And that was that was the focus. John Fund. John? 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 Can I ask you a question about the Office Sorry. of Professional yes. Hi, Peter Alexander from NBC. Yeah. To be clear, dozens of girls were allegedly molested. Why didn't you just keep investigating and then follow up? So the victims of which we were aware were part of this. And, and under the agreement in the Southern District of Florida, the investigation ceased and they had the opportunity to proceed civilly. That does not mean that the investigation had to cease nationwide. And as we see today, as we saw in New York, investigations could certainly and obviously have proceeded in other districts. And the follow-up, how can you be trusted to enforce human trafficking laws as Secretary of Labor given your history with this case? So. I have been, I started one of the first human trafficking task forces at the Department of Justice. I have been aggressive prosecuting human trafficking. We stood, we stepped in in this case, and we stopped a bad state plea. And so I understand from today's perspective that people scratch their heads and they say, why? Here's the question to ask, how many other times have you seen a U.S. Attorney's Office intervene in a state matter and say, stop the state plea because it is insufficient. Yes. I want to ask you a question about the Office of Professional Responsibility. Um, earlier this year, it was disclosed that they're, going to, they're doing a review into how you and other prosecutors mm -hmm. in your office handled this matter. 
What is the status of that? What exactly are they looking at? Will you submit to an interview, even though you're no longer with the Justice Department? And if they find any misconduct, will you resign? Um, first, I don't know what the status of that is. Um, I would refer that to the Office of Professional Responsibility. I don't speak for them. Um, I will clearly submit for an interview, even though I don't have to. Um, I think what they do is important. The Office of Professional Responsibility will have access to the full record. They will have access to all the facts. They will have access to the FBI reports. They'll have access to the victim interviews. They can look at this matter in its totality. Um, and, and so I think it is important that they proceed. I will gladly be part of it. And, and I think what they will find is that the office acted appropriately. Ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Secretary Acosta, it's Yami Shell Center with PBS NewsHour. As Labor Secretary, you've tried repeatedly to cut a program that deals with, with human trafficking in the Labor Department by up to 80 percent, going before Congress advocating for that. Why should people trust you to focus on human trafficking and protect victims if you've done that? And I'd like a follow-up question. Um, so you're referring to grants that go to foreign countries um, for foreign country uh, labor-related work as part of the budget every year those grants have been removed, as have other grants for foreign countries. And let me just add, as part of the budget every year, those grants are put right back in by Congress. Uh, this is what happens in Washington, and I fully suspect that those grants will remain in this year. Your follow-up. Um, my follow-up question is, sources have told me that the President encouraged you to hold this press conference. Can you speak a little bit about what the President told you ahead of this press conference and whether you're, you're here to give a message to the President? Are you fighting for your job or, or are you trying to send a message to victims? And if so, what is the message to victims who say they don't trust you anymore? So uh, first, I'm not about to talk about conversations with the President and I'm not here to send any signal to the President. I think it's important. A lot of questions were raised. And I, this has reached the point that I think it's important to have a public hearing. I think it's important that these questions be asked and answered. And, and as to a message to the victims, um, the message is you need to come forward. I heard this morning that another victim came forward and made horrendous, horrendous allegations. Allegations that should never happen to any woman, much less a young girl. And as victims come forward, these cases can be brought, and they can be brought by the federal government, they can be brought by state attorneys, and they will be brought. We have seen in the last few years cases brought against individuals that got away with things for well over a decade. And you know, it's, it's important to realize that people were getting away with these. People were not going to jail at all. And we're aware of those high profile cases, and we've seen as victims come forward how the justice system deals with them. And so the message to victims is come forward. Sir. Mr. Secretary. Secretary. Let, let, let me take a few more. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Richard Madden, CTV. You just said victims need to come forward. I'm sorry, Richard? Madden with CTV Television. Yes. Uh, you just said a moment ago the victims should come forward, but you still haven't offered an apology to them. Why is that? So the victims should come forward because the justice system needs to hear from them. And what the victims went through is horrific. What the victims continue to go through is horrific. I've seen these videos. I've seen the interviews. I, I'm sorry, I've seen the interviews on, on television of these victims and, and their stories. And, and so it's hard. But I also think it's important that we understand that the men and women of my office going back to 2006 and 2007 and 2008, have spent their career prosecuting these types of cases. And in their heart, in our heart, we were trying to do the right thing for these victims. And so this is horrific. This is awful. Um, each one of these cases is just devastating and saddening. Um, but I also think it's important to realize that the prosecutors were trying to do the right thing. Sir. Yeah, Jeff Earl from Daily Mail. How are you? Um, are you aware of alleged obstruction of justice by Mr. Epstein? Uh, it seemed to have been mentioned in a, in, a, in a note in a bail memo by New York prosecutors. And did he take efforts to, in, to intimidate prosecutors? And if he did, or harass witnesses, 
tamper witnesses. If he did that, why would he get what's been viewed, what's been called a sweetheart deal? I, I, I can't, I can't comment on the New York case. That that, that would not be appropriate. Are you aware Sir, of it in Florida? I'm talking about it in Florida. Did he obstruct justice? Sir, there, there, there is a pending New York case in, in New York. I can't comment. Sir. I, I'm curious, who at Maine Justice, at Neil McCabe, One American News, who at Maine Justice reviewed this case or your decision, and did you have any interaction with Robert Mueller at the time? Um, so I, I shared a letter that I wrote to one of Epstein's defense attorneys, and I shared that letter in part because it shows much of the timeline. It shows how initially um, the, the meetings that took place were between the, uh, in July, between the first assistant, the criminal chief, the Palm Beach, the Palm Beach office chief, and the line attorney and two FBI agents with Epstein's attorneys. You'll notice that the initial meeting, as outlined in this letter, were all career attorneys, how they presented the terms, how Epstein's attorneys were dissatisfied and asked for a meeting with me, how I subsequently went with their attorneys, along with all the career officials, how at that meeting we then invited the chief of the child exploitation and obscenity section from the Department of Justice to travel down because one of the you know, one of the things we wanted to make sure of was that we had, going back to the earlier question about the ABA rule, that we had sufficient evidence to proceed ethically. Um, and then it details a little bit on how Epstein's counsels appealed the decisions to Washington. I'd refer you to the record. You know, one of the really disturbing things about this case is there's a record here. The documents that I shared today, we've shared previously with media, yet I've seen no reference to any of these documents in the perspective of some of these prosecutors. There is a record. All these documents are publicly available and could have been pulled up by anyone in this room. And so, and, and, and so you know, there, there is a record that will, you know, I wasn't at Maine Justice. I do not have a full list of the individuals that, that reviewed this matter at Maine Justice. I can tell you. Um, the individual's reference in this letter. Um, and, and I would refer you to the record because I, this was 12 years ago. I do not have a full list of the individuals that reviewed this at Maine Justice. justice. Um, well, the, as, as the record makes clear, individuals from Maine Justice were involved uh, fairly early on and were certainly aware of it. And, and I think if you look at the record, it will become clear that our decisions were appealed again and again to, to main justice. Sir. Um, Adam Shiver from the Financial Times. Um, so the deal that you negotiated uh, resulted in two things. One is that the case ended with Mr. Epstein pleading to state prostitution charges, and another thing that it did was that it immunized his co-conspirators. So two questions. Did you consider his victims in that case to be prostitutes, and why did you immunize his co-conspirators? -cons um, so the answer to were the victims prostitutes? No. Victims, they were victims. End of story. They were victims. Um, the second part of that is in the purpose in this case was to bring Epstein to jail, to put him behind bars. And so there were other individuals that may have been involved that um, in any type of conspiracy, there are individuals around someone. Um, the focus really is on the top player. And that's where our focus appropriately was. Let me, um, let me also say something, because a lot has been said about this 13 month. Um, when we proceeded, the expectation was that it would be an 18 month sentence. And the expectation was that it would be served in jail. And so this work release was complete BS. And I've been on record as far back as 2011 saying that it was not what was bargained for and it was not what we expected. But this was a state court plea, and because it was a state court plea, the terms of confinement were under the jurisdiction of the state of Florida. And so the outrage over that 13 month, you know, getting to, to leave jail is entirely appropriate. When we entered into this, we, I at least, fully thought that he would be spending the time in jail. That's what we mean by someone going to jail. Sir, if I can get um, Linda Contreras from Telemundo Network, if I can get a brief statement in Spanish. 
I would really appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you what, if you answer the, you want, if, if you ask me a question in Spanish, I will answer in Spanish. Is that fair? Well, I was trying to get a brief statement, I mean, so that I will go over with what everyone already said. En, déjame, en un, un minuto. Nuestros fiscales en este asunto querían que este señor fuera a la cárcel. Era increíble e importante que él fuera a la cárcel porque eso es donde él tenía que estar. Y poner todas las otras personas en el país en, 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 no, en, en, en notice que él era un hombre muy malo, que él era un predator sexual. Y por eso es que hicimos este asunto. ¿Debería usted disculparse con ellos, con las víctimas? Perdón. ¿Debería usted disculparse con las víctimas? Muchos de los colegas han hecho esa pregunta. Las víctimas han sufrido mucho en este asunto. Y yo he mirado algunos de los, eh, de los interviews, de los, eh, ayúdeme, de interviews, de, de las entrevistas. Y eh, es un asunto muy, muy difícil. Pero a la misma vez, nuestros fiscales trataron de hacer lo que podían con lo que tenían en este caso. Did, did, did you ask a question already? I did. Okay, let, 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 me, let me go to someone. someone yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said earlier that your message to victims was to come forward. What's your message specifically to those who did come forward and felt let down by you? Um, they came, look, victims came forward, and, and there were several victims. You know, I, I believe that in one of the filings, the Department of Justice um, talked to several of the victims. And some of the victims just didn't want any, any public notoriety. Um, other victims have provided interviews and said they felt left, let down, that they were let down. Um, these are really hard cases. The prosecutors in my office and I were focused on putting him in jail. I provided the information from the career attorney as to why there were concerns if we went to trial and it became clear that they were going to receive money if he was convicted, how that would impeach their credibility. And, and today, that would proceed very differently because victim shaming is, is just not accepted. But the circumstances of trials and what juries would consider 12 years ago was different. And so these were the judgments that were made. I understand that, that individuals will look at these judgments and say, well, maybe a different judgment should have been made. You know, you can always look at a play after the fact and say, should it have been the safe play or should you have gone for the big score? And ask, which is the right outcome? But I provided these documents so that you could hear from the prosecutors themselves how these documents how this was being weighed. Sir. Uh, Jesse Sagman, Vice News. Did the Miami Herald reach out to you last November? And if so, why didn't you set the record straight on the breakfast meeting then? Um, so media has reached out to me over the years about this. I, I think it's very important. The Department of Justice is the entity that is litigating all these matters. And quite honestly, until, until recently, I haven't commented on this since 2011 because I think it's important for the United States to litigate cases through the Department of Justice. And if former U.S. attorneys responded to media inquiries about pending cases, and this is a pending case, there was a live, and there still is a live civil matter. If former U.S. attorneys responded to media inquiries all the time, we'd have havoc in our justice system. You can't have a Department of Justice as a litigating entity with U.S. attorneys giving press statements. Now, your follow-up question may be, why am I talking today? And the answer is, this has clearly reached a level where I thought it was important to have this kind of press conference to take questions um, and, and, and to, to provide these facts and these perspectives. And I understand that individuals may say this was not enough. Um, but this is the way it was viewed, not only by me, but by many back in 2008. Secretary, Secretary, Secretary. Secretary. Yes, uh, Doug Christian from uh, Talk Media News. Yes. One thing, yes. Um, you said that the victims were not prostitutes, but the agreement was he was jailed for prostitution charges, not for child for, for sex trafficking. 
Can you just, uh, just the, say what the, the distinction the was? Agreement, the agreement was, this was a state, here's, here's why, why this is hard. This was a state case. He was arraigned, he, a state grand jury returned a prostitution charge against him, a solicitation charge, if I recall. That was a state grand jury. He was allowed to self-surrender by the state attorney's office as a result of that single charge that it would have resulted in no jail time. And ultimately, what the agreement did was say, you have to go back and you have to plead to a more serious state charge that requires jail time, that requires registration, and under this agreement, you'll have a mechanism for restitution. But the agreement itself, you know, ultimately, the state of Florida and the state attorney's office in Florida is a separate sovereign. The U.S. attorney does not determine how those offices run themselves or what charges they bring. I do not consider the victims prostitutes. I, I think that is insulting to them. These were victims. They were not just women victims, they were children victims. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary um, I'm Deborah Saunders with the Las Vegas Review Journal. Um, since Mr. Epstein left jail, he's been a public figure. He's been a man about town. He hasn't seemed particularly contrite about what he did. What have you thought when you've seen him? You know, what I've thought is I keep reading newspaper articles about pending investigations here or there. You know, if, uh, if someone does a Google search, they'll see that there were rumors of investigations going on for the last 10 years. And uh, New York finally stood up and stood up and they took one of those investigations and they brought charges and in all candor I wish it would have happened um, I'm, I'm glad to see that it's happening now um, he's a you know he's a bad man and and he needs to be put away and um, you know based on additional allegations that I saw this morning um, there, there are multiple jurisdictions whether federal or state that that he's gonna have to answer to a, a few a few a few, a few more a few more questions Yes. Uh, Alex Dockery with Miami Herald. I wanted yeah. to ask and follow up with your answer to the earlier question about the potential co-conspirators. Were you confident at the time that any potential additional co-conspirators didn't commit uh, sexual abuses against underage girls like Epstein did, even if it may not have been at the same scale? Because some of those victims have accused others of doing similar acts to them. So um, let me see how I can address your question without running afoul of Department of Justice guidelines. Um, if my office had been aware of individuals who committed acts such as, as, as sexual abuse, you know, my office, it would not have been my position that those individuals should have been part of, of that kind of, of, of immunity. It's not even an immunity deal. It should not have been part of that paragraph. And so, so I know that there are a lot of rumors about who those individuals may or may not be. Um, I think those rumors um, are misconstruing the acts of the office with respect to that particular paragraph. One more question. Uh, Richard Lardner from the Associated Press. Mr. Secretary, were you ever made aware at any point in your handling of this case if Mr. Epstein was an intelligence asset of some sort? Um, so, 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 so there has there has been reporting to that effect, and and let me say um, there's been reporting to a lot of effects in in, in this case, uh, not just now but over the years, and and again, I would 